Okay, welders, take two on this video. You have a final exam coming up the week of January the 25th, and probably this final will be used for a couple of years in the future at least. Your Miller Open Book talks about shielded metal arc welding, SMAW, gas metal arc welding, GMAW, what we call MIG, and uh, TIG welding, uh, tungsten gas arc welding. The very last section that you're covering this coming week is for the gas welding and plasma cutting. And I want to talk about the plasma cutting, they do a pretty decent job of talking about. But they don't do a very good job with the gas welding. And I wanted to just walk you through gas welding. On your test review, we're going to start with question number 16. Now, my last video, I kept looking up. If it looks like I'm looking at something, don't worry, I'm just distracted with everything else that's going on in the shop, or it's my glasses, I, I don't know. Or I could be thinking. So just, just go with it. I found it a little distracting in the last video. Your oxyfuel welding, OFW, or your oxyfuel cutting, OFC, Units are basically the same except for the type of torch that goes on the end of them. And I'm going to unfurl uh, this hose here because I'm going to use this one in a moment. This is a cutting tip. There are two valves on the torch body. There is a fuel hose and an oxygen hose. Fuel for the most part is always red. Oxygen is, for the most part, always green, except for older units, and you might find one of these where this is black. Go with it. These are made out of brass and no steel, no carbon steel in them so that they will not create a spark when you're working on them. The valves. When you're doing these, of course, it's righty-tighty, righty close lefty open. When you're working these, two fingers. When it stops, it stops. Pinky finger in the air. We're very refined in this shop. When you open it, two fingers. If you crank this, it is possible to deform the inside of this to the point where it won't work. To replace these valves, we're talking um, some money that I would rather not spend, especially when if you take care of this, this will stay in working order without any maintenance 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more. So please take care of the equipment. The other torch that we have in this shop is a welding tip. This is just a regular curved tip with a nozzle. They come in different sizes depending on the hole in the end of them. I like to use the zero, or what they call an aught, or a one. Some teachers prefer the double aught. There's even a triple aught. It means it's very small. There's a few of you in advanced welding that started this last year. And if you can find those students that had gas welding, they'll tell you that if you can master this, it makes your electric welding a lot easier, especially when we're talking about running the puddle. All right, let's take a look at the gauges. Okay, gauges. I'm going to see if I can do this where you can see better than the last time. The gauge that is closest to the cylinder, this is the cylinder pressure. The gauge that is on the hose side, this is for the hose pressure. Never, ever use any oil, any type of oil with these. If you get a needle that's sticking, tap it. If it's still sticking, we're done. Any type of petroleum distillates, oil, gas, whatever, and oxygen do not mix. They become very explosive. The other thing that I wanted to point out to you, and this is one of the questions, you'll notice that the oxygen, that's this one, has a female fitting. 
to go on the cylinder. The acetylene, or the fuel gas, has a male fitting. Also, there is a notch cut into this, this landing on the nut here. This one is a right-handed thread, righty-tighty. This one, because it has this indication in it, this is done backwards. This is lefty-tighty, righty-loosey. The reason that these two look different and are set up so differently is to make it impossible for you to hook the oxygen regulator up to the acetylene cylinder, and it's impossible for you to, to hook the fuel regulator up to the oxygen. That's because the oxygen cylinder runs at a much higher pressure than the fuel cylinder does. So I just wanted to bring that out and show you. And it does talk about that on one of the questions. We'll get to that in just a moment. Caps. Never move one of these cylinders without a cap on top unless it is chained to the cart or it's chained, in this case, to the booth or the wall. Always move them with a cap on top. It protects the cylinder valve on top. One of my teacher colleagues tells the story when he was working in Montana, kids in the shop were messing around, something happened, oxygen cylinder fell over, the valve hit the edge of the work table, came off, the bottle was brand new, it just come from the supplier. Bottle went through a cinder block wall, through the classroom, happened to go down between the rows of chairs with students in the class, went out the other cinder block wall on the other side, and they found it I think a half a mile or a mile away. This is a missile when it's fully charged. All right. So, question number 16. Let's look at some questions. Question 16. An oxygen acetylene flame produces heat. Miller Open Book tells you specifically 5,589 degrees Fahrenheit. Most textbooks will say somewhere around 6,000 or 5,500 to 6,500. I want the Miller Open Book answer. Number 17, oxyacetylene welding can join dissimilar metals. Depending on the welding process, we can solder carbon steel and stainless steel together. We can braze copper to a metal fitting. We can do dissimilar metals using oxy gas. It's not just one type of metal, but it depends on the welding process. Is it solder? Is it brazing? Is it filler rod? Okay. Number 18, maximum pressure. All right, let's talk about how we set this up. When you come up to this apparatus, you need to treat it like the last person that used it did not know what they were doing and they left everything turned on, full blast. The first thing you do when you come up to one of these and you want to use it is you make sure that the regulator screws are fully released. You should be able to take two fingers and move these in those two fingers. If you cannot, then you back it out. It's lefty-loosey, counterclockwise. Release them until such time as you get that. If the screw comes all the way out, don't panic. You haven't done anything wrong. We just need to get it threaded back in. That can take a couple of minutes to do. All right. Next thing you do when you come up to the apparatus is you make sure that the torch valves are all closed. Just gently put two fingers on. Are they closed? These are. To turn this on, we're going to stand to the side of the unit. I went into my first shop class in eighth grade. I think I was what, 13 or 14 years old. I'm almost 60, so that's about 47 years ago. I have been told all of my life, and I have instructed numerous thousands of students. We always stand to the side. 
There is a very rare possibility that when you release the pinup pressure in this bottle, and it can be over 2,000 pounds per square inch, when we release the pressure in this bottle and we go through this tube and into the back of the regulator and into the gauge, that it's possible that that pressure can blow the gauge out. If you're standing in front of it, you're going to get shrapnel. I've never seen one of these come apart. Knock on wood. So we stand to the side. We're going to open this. We're going to crack it, let the pressure in, then we're going to open it all the way. Let me back up one second and talk about the bottles. This bottle is drawn from one piece of molten steel. When it's molten, it's run through a form, it's drawn out, pulled into its proper shape. There is no seams in here. If you turn this over and look at the bottom, it's got a little bell shape in the bottom to give it something to roll around on and stand on. The top is machined down. This is put on it, basically like friction welded or machined into it. The threads are machined into here and you've got outside threads for the cap, you have inside threads for the valve. These bottles can be new. You check them by looking on here for the last inspection date. And on this particular bottle, uh, it's brand new because it's never been inspected. Oh, it was inspected in January of 2018. It'll be stamped. I have worked with bottles before the turn of the century that were stamped in 18, 1918. I think we have one or two bottles here on campus that we found that were stamped in the 1920s. So these bottles have a lifespan of over a hundred years if you treat them right. The only thing that happens is the older they get, the less pressure they will hold because every time this is filled and then this discharged, microscopically, it expands and contracts. So over time, it can stretch the metal out and cause it to become, as we learned in the characteristics of metal, it can cause fatigue in here. So if we were to take a 100-year-old bottle and put as much pressure in it as when it was brand new, there's a likelihood it could fail. But we know that if we lower the pressure, there's a relationship between the pressure and the age of the steel, and we can still use them safely. In the case of a 100-year-old bottle, instead of having 2,000 pounds per square inch, it may have 1,000 or 900 pounds per square inch. Still perfectly usable. Acetylene bottles. Older acetylene bottles will come in two pieces. There will be a weld across the middle where the two halves were put together. This particular bottle has no welding on it. I haven't looked at the bottom to see what the bottom looks like. Usually there's a blowout plug in the bottom. There are blowout plugs here in the top. But the inside of this bottle traditionally is filled with a sponge-like material. We add liquid acetone, paint thinner, acetone into here and then we put the compressed acetylene in and that acetone absorbs that gas and then releases it as we release the pressure. And that's how this bottle works. Both of these bottles are heavy. You do not just pick them up, you roll them across the floor. All right, back to turning the apparatus on. I'm going to stand to the side, I'm going to crack the valve, and then once I hear the pressure enter the, the gauge, I'm then going to turn it on all the way. You might be able to hear it. We could hear it in the last video. So what's happened is when I released it, this whole valve apparatus kind of sprung a little bit. The gauge rose to a thousand. This gauge is still at zero. That means that this is properly released. For the oxygen, you turn this on all the way. For acetylene, I'm going to stand over here, kind of to the side. This one, you turn a quarter of a turn, or a wrist, as far as your wrist will go. 
just like that, let it go. A lot of students, when they first start, they think that's not turned on enough. It's turned on plenty. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set, this is a cutting torch. On the hose side, I've got markings from zero, then the next one is 50 and 100. In between, there's a bigger mark at the 25 pound mark. For cutting, traditionally, we want somewhere around 40 to 50 pounds per square inch to run the cutting torch. For welding, we want about 20 pounds per square inch. I'm going to set this at 50 for the cutting torch. So we screw this in, we watch this gauge go up. There's two rows of numbers. The outside numbers are in the metric system, kilopascals or newtons. I think it's pascals. And on the inside, it's in red, it's in pounds per square inch. We're going to set it at the 50. On this one, there's about 80 pounds left in this bottle. I'm going to run it under no circumstances in our Eunice High School, New Mexico shop. Will you run this over five pounds per square inch? Textbooks, Miller Open Book, will tell you that the red line on this particular bottle, the red line is at 15 pounds per square inch. Acetylene becomes unstable over 15 pounds per square inch. As it's coming through the nozzle, those molecules of acetylene can actually rub together, create friction, and ignite. So we don't want it to do that. We want it to ignite when we want it to ignite. So please do not set this at more than five. Is there an occasion when we would need more than five pounds per square inch? Yes, if we were cutting something that was thicker, say more than an inch thick or so, we might need more than the five pounds per square inch, but we're gonna set this at five. Okay, I'm getting ready to light the torch. Always know where your hoses are. I prefer my hoses to be behind me. I don't want them in front of me. I want to know where is my torch going to go as I swing it around. I don't want to cut across a hose. Not a very happy thing to have happen. Okay. Right now, the camera is approximately seven or eight feet from the bottles. So I've got plenty of room here. Always make sure you have the appropriate eye protection. In this case, this is a shade three. Now I'm just gonna be showing you the different flames, so I'm going to use my glasses to do this. You want a flint igniter, what we call a striker. There is a flint in here on a striking pad. When it wears down, I can put in a new one. We're going to open the fuel gas, let the fuel gas go through. We're gonna hold our striker right up in front and we're gonna strike it and we're gonna blow it out. As it blows out, it'll ignite that cloud of fuel. Do not wait too long or else you'll get a big cloud of fuel ignited. I am going to make sure and turn my oxygen on down here on the torch body. This is the torch body. This cutting head is an attachment. We turn this oxygen all the way on. The fuel is controlled here. Our oxygen is controlled here. I want to show you the three flames. In the Miller Open Book, they talk about three flames. So here we go. So I'm turning the fuel on, and I've lit it. Don't need my striker. I'm going to get rid of it. This that's coming off, this is unburned acetylene. If it gets on your clothes, the soot, just wait till you get home or get a cloth and just brush it off. If it leaves a mark on your clothes, it will come out in the wash. Do not worry. This acetylene is combining with the oxygen in the atmosphere. I can turn this up and I can get rid of most of that soot cloud. Now I'm going to add oxygen. All right, this white flame is called a carburizing flame. It is heavy on fuel. This will leave a black mark, a soot mark on the metal. So we don't want to use this. Plus it's not quite hot enough to use. 
Instead, we want a neutral flame. Now, a neutral flame, you can't see this very well, but on the camera, it's very bright blue right here, almost white. There's little cones coming out of the holes where the fuel and the uh, oxygen are mixing. This blue part out here is called the feather. And it's making a very pleasant little, I don't want to call it a hissing sound, but it's, it's just making a little roar right now. This is our neutral flame. We're getting one part of oxygen, one part of fuel. It's all combining. There is no soot out here. Also, be very careful. Even out here, I can feel the heat of the flame. You don't take a torch up to somebody and brush it across them or you will set them on fire and you will be out of this shop. The other flame, say we had carburizing, carburizing. We've had neutral. This is called an oxidizing flame. The oxygen is pushing the flame out and away from the torch. If I hit the torch lever, I can blow it out. Way too much oxygen overpowering the flame. It can't stay ignited. So let me relight. Our flame, we want to have this just nice little pleasant roar to it. We don't want... In the oxidizing flame, it's trying to push the flame away from the torch tip. So we want the neutral flame. This is what we want to work with. On a cutting torch, this works by heating the metal. We're going to take a stream of oxygen. You can see that little line where the stream of oxygen is, and we're going to blow the molten metal out of the, out of the kerf. Now, to turn this off, fire needs three things, heat, oxygen, and fuel. If I turn the oxygen off, I still have a fire because this is combining with the oxygen in the atmosphere. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the fuel off first. Fire goes out. And I'm going to turn the oxygen off. Now there's a question. After you're done cutting or welding, what do you do? The first thing you do is you turn the valves off on top of the cylinders. And again, just turn them to when they stop. You don't have to crank them. And this is a quarter of a turn specifically in case something happens one wrist, you're off. Now, what we're going to do to shut this rig down is I'm going to take and open the fuel and I'm going to purge the fuel through the torch. I'm going to watch the gauges go to zero. They're at zero. I'm going to close the valve daintily. I'm going to open the oxygen. You can hear it come out. Watch the gauges go to zero. I'm going to shut the oxygen valve and I'm going to close this one off. And again, dainty pinky finger in the air, very proper. The last thing I'm going to do is release these regulator screws. And I'm going to back them out again until I can do two fingers just like that. This rig is now turned completely off. That's all there is to it. I'm going to curl up my hoses. I'm going to put my torch down into the tray. Done. So now let's review questions. Number 18 in our shop, the maximum pressure for acetylene in the torch hose is five pounds per square inch. 15 is a choice. 15 is not the correct answer in our Eunice High School shop. And on your review, I tell you what the correct answer is. 
19, the most desirable flame to weld with is a neutral flame. 20, name the two types of flames that you do not want to weld with. That would be carburizing and oxidizing. 21, the most common reasons for a tip popping. So, when we're gas welding, we hold this like a pencil. Where we have the hose as part of our arm where all we have to do is hold this. If the tip gets too close to what we're welding, it can push the fuel back into the flame, back into the tip, and then it pushes itself out and it pops. And pieces of little molten metal fly everywhere. And usually the first time it happens, and it happens to me, and I'm older, even now I jump when this happens. So, but the reason that it pops is because you're too close to what you're working on. 22, what are the first two steps in setting up an oxygen acetylene welder from scratch? You make sure that these regulator screws are released. That's it. You make sure the system is off, and you make sure the regulators are released. I can't make it any simpler. 23, what must you do before lighting the torch after you've just put the system together? Now, we're assuming that we've just put everything together. What do we do? We check for leaks. How do you check for leaks? I make sure the torch is off. I've got these fittings as tight as I, can, as I think I need them. I'm going to open the valve. I'm going to close it. I'm going to watch the gauges. If the gauges drop, I have an obvious leak. I might not hear it, but I have an obvious leak, so I'm going to recheck everything. If I still can't find the leak, I'm going to get a mixture of soapy dishwater, and I'm going to either paintbrush it on or I'm going to spray it on with a spray bottle, and I'm going to look for bubbles, but I'm going to check for leaks. Okay, 24. When you are finished oxyacetylene welding, it is important to do what? Just after you shut off the oxygen and acetylene at the torch handle, you are to turn off the bottles. Then we'll purge the gases, but we want to turn the bottles off first. 25, the gas pressure in the regulator is adjusted with a T screw. This is in the shape of a T, I think you can see that. If not, let me get one out here. See, it's in the shape of the letter T. Okay, T screw. We call it a regulator adjustment screw. 26, when setting an oxygen regulator for welding, it should be at about 20 pounds per square inch, and the acetylene regulator should be set at five. For cutting, we set the torch at 40 to 50 pounds of oxygen and 5 pounds for acetylene. If we are welding, we set it at 20 and 5. 27, you open the oxygen cylinder how far? All the way. 28, you open the acetylene cylinder how far? A quarter turn or what I called a wrist. 29, whoops, went too far. 29, acetylene cylinders are usually red and have left-handed threads. Ours are black and they have left-handed threads. 30, you can tell by looking at the blank to see if it is notched on a regulator to determine if it belongs to the oxygen or the acetylene. We are looking at this fitting right here. If it has this notch in the flats across the lands here, we know that this goes on the fuel. Also, the fuel, this is a male fitting, but it's going to tighten going backwards, what we would normally say is loosening the, uh, the fastener. Okay, number 31. The nut on an acetylene regulator has a notch on it. Not a knock, but a notch. 
32 regular sunglasses are adequate to wear for OFW or oxyfield welding? The answer is no. You need proper safety glasses. If you want to use a $100 pair of Ray-Bans, you go right ahead and use that $100 pair of Ray-Bans, but two things are going to happen. If something comes at those glasses and shatters those glasses, you're going to have glass in your eyes. Secondly, if you start popping the metal, you're going to have hot pieces of uh, metal embedding themselves in the glasses, and then you will be very unhappy. Please use the safety goggles glasses that I have in the shop. And 33, the two gauges on the regulator indicate cylinder pressure, hose pressure, or working pressure. So that is the questions for oxygas that are on the final. I've also gone through the startup and the shutdown on using the oxygas. Hopefully you can use that. If there's anything else you need to know on the final review, please email me and let me know. I'll be happy to either make another video or I'll be happy to email you back with what you need to know. Remember that your final is open notes, so if you answer all of these 60 questions, I'm going to pull no more than 50 off. So you will have everything you need right there in front of you. They will not be the same order of the answers that you have on here, but the questions will be worded the same. These questions come off of Miller Open Book for the most part, plus it comes off of the things that I've taught. The Oxy Gas, I went more in depth than Miller Open Book did. Just want you guys to have it there. Okay, thanks for watching. Good luck on your finals, and I hope to see you in the shop next semester.